do Viber. Eu sei que muitos de vocês usam o Viber. Então eu queria pedir a presença de todos vocês aqui para acompanhar o que o Tom Marco vai falar para a gente. Ele tem muita história interessante para contar para nós. E eu acho que vale a audiência de vocês. Então se vocês puderem parar os jogos um pouquinho, parar os downloads e chegar aqui no palco principal. Tom Marco da Viber, do Viber, perdão. Vai contar para a gente um pouco da história da trajetória da empresa. Vamos lá, é, eu vou passar a palavra para o Marco, mas conto com todo mundo aqui, hein, galera? Vamos chegando aqui no palco principal, fundador e CEO do Viber vai contar um pouco para a gente da trajetória da empresa e os planos para o futuro do aplicativo. Valeu, galera. Talma, Marco, fundador e CEO do Viber. Thank you. So, I guess I don't need to tell you my name because I heard it several times. Uh, God, I can hardly hear myself. Before we start with all of this, first of all, let me promise you one thing. This is not an, um, uh, an advertising campaign for Viber. So I will try to talk about what we do as little as possible and try to stick to this. But before that, just a show of hands, how, how many of you know uh, what we do, what Viber does? Okay, I won't tell you what we do. Now, I am going to show you a picture, okay? And when I show that picture, I want you to register what is the first thing that comes to your mind. What is the first thing that this brings up uh, in your head, okay? So, ready, set, go. Now, how many of you see a glass of water which is half full? How many of you see a glass of water which is half empty? Okay. We're a bit optimistic here. We see the half full glass, except you. You see the half empty one. I'll tell you what I see. When I look at this, I see opportunity. In fact, every time, and, and maybe this is just me, but I look around and something doesn't work right. So. Uh, you go on a website, you fill your details, you go to the next screen, something is wrong, you hit the back button and go like, oh, now they ask me for my details again. You go to a restaurant, something is wrong. You walk down the street and something just doesn't work. I mean, we're surrounded by these things every single day of our life. So sometimes we just notice them, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we'll go on Twitter and, sorry, pardon my French, but bitch about it. But we're surrounded by things which don't work well. And every time you see something which doesn't work right, it's not an opportunity to complain. It's an opportunity to do something about it to make it better. Because if something is wrought right, if you can improve it, maybe there is a way that you can actually do something out of it. So there's an opportunity. Here's an example. This guy who unfortunately is no longer with us. His name is, was, sorry, uh, Bernard Sato. Bernard Sato was an American. And in 1970, long before all of us, or most of us, I'm not sure, were born, uh, he was flying back to the US from a family vacation in Aruba. And he was at the airport and he looked around and he noticed that they were carrying bags on a trolley, on a, on, I, I don't know what you call that. Um, and they were carrying the bags around and obviously that had wheels. And he was tired because he was carrying his suitcase all over the airport. And then he had the aha moment. He, he noticed something, he thought about something that he didn't consider before. He said, what if we took that suitcase and we added wheels to it? What if we got something like this? Now, this looks pretty obvious, right? I mean, presumably every one of you that has a suitcase has something that looks just like this. But in 1970, nobody had a suitcase that looked like this. So, he saw something that wasn't working well, and instead of telling his wife, oh, it's so hot in here, I need to continue carrying my suitcase, he actually did something about it. He did this. And many of the startups around you 
started exactly like that. Somebody that wasn't happy about something, somebody saw an opportunity, and instead of complaining, instead of registering, okay, I'm not happy, did something about it. Um, if you look at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg was trying to get girls. I don't know if it worked out for him, but we got Facebook. And in our case, in the case of Viber, we, the people behind the company, myself especially, were just not happy with one application. We were not happy with Skype. We were not happy, and the year is 2009, 2010. I was in a long distance relationship. Uh, I had a girlfriend at the time, she's now my wife. You can argue if that's a good or bad thing. Um, and there were so many things that were frustrating to us as Skype users. It was difficult to add people, right? You would have to ask somebody for their user ID, add them, they would need to approve you. It was a very long process. But what was worse, it was, okay, let's say we are friends. Now I want to contact you. I want to send you a message or I want to uh, have a call with you. We would need to go what's called out of band to make a regular phone call, send an SMS, or schedule it in advance. There was no such thing as, I'm gonna send you a message and you're going to answer. Unless, of course, I was in front of my desktop and you were in front of yours. But the world is not like that. We do not spend, well, I hope for you, that you do not spend all your day in front of a computer. So, we were not happy about it. And we, we thought, you know what? We could actually do something about it. We could make it better. And we thought we would build something where it was easy to add people. And instead of using a user ID, we did what is now pretty common, which is user phone number. We do that, WhatsApp does this, a bunch of other applications do that. And we would keep the app always on, always connected, whether via push notifications, but you could always send a message, you could always make a call, no matter where that person was. Even today, we like to say that the difference between uh, Viber, WhatsApp, and all of these applications, and Skype, is the fact that on our apps, you do things without scheduling them. And on Skype, you have to schedule. Most Skype calls, most Skype exchanges are uh, pre-scheduled. The other thing that we want, made sure to do was to make it easy, really easy to use. So we worked hard, I mean really hard, for nine months in 2010. And in this, on December 2nd, 2010, we launched Viber. And it worked. Within three days, one million people around the world download the app. We did not go on a massive advertising campaign. We did not go on a, a crazy PR campaign. We did not go on Jay Leno. There was one uh, press release. Uh, there was one article on TechCrunch uh, that said that Vib Viber is amazingly amazing. And we were out there. Today, we have over 300 million users around the world. Uh, we are the number one or number two messaging app in most countries, uh, or, or sorry, in. Yeah, number one or number two in most countries. Definitely number one on voice in almost every single market out there in terms of uh, on mobile. But as I said, we are not here to talk about Viber. So I'm gonna make some references, but try to stay away from that. So my first advice to you, uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, okay? Be aware of what's happening around you. Don't dream of applications, of startups, of companies uh, out of context. Be aware of what's going on. Be aware of the things which bug you. Uh, be aware of the half-empty glass. Be aware of how you can make things better. And ask yourself, can you make it better? If your answer is a yes, then congratulations. You made the first step towards being a successful entrepreneur. The bad news is that there are many other steps, but you just started. My next piece of advice is go online. They say that half an hour on the internet will save you half a million dollars and half a year of work. It's true. There are many people that raise, that, that raise money, built a business plan, 
started working, and then somewhere along the way realized that there was somebody else doing the same thing or has already done the same thing. Now, let's face it. You'll be hard-pressed to do something which is completely unlike anything else before. We're in 2014, okay? Uh, it, the year is not 1914 or 1514. And probably even back then, most of the things that were being done were based on other things which were being done. Um, we did not reinvent the wheel. Uh, Facebook did not reinvent the wheel. Google did not reinvent the wheel. Everybody had something similar done before. But you should ask yourself, is yours the same? Can you truly say that yours is different? Now, it doesn't have to be, as I said, something which is completely unlike anything else before. Okay? You are not going to run into this. If this is the bar that you are setting, you are never going to build anything. Because in every space, in every field, uh, if you look at Tesla, there were electric cars before. Um, if you look at Amazon, people were selling books before. <clears throat> people were probably selling things online before Amazon. So it doesn't need to be 100% original, but it needs to be sufficiently different, sufficiently differentiated, whether it's differentiated uh, from the competition in what it does. Maybe it's differentiated in the market. Maybe you, there's this really cool company that is already gaining traction in the US or in Europe, but it's not available in Brazil. Copying is okay. It is okay to copy somebody else's ideas and bring them to Brazil. Now, some people will say that you're a copycat. That's fine. Let them say it. You'll be counting the money all the way to the bank if you're successful. Now, one way, so look at it, is it different? The other question, can the other guys who are already established, can they copy it really fast? And does it make sense for them to copy it really fast? When we were doing Viber, people told us, okay, this is nice. Skype is going to do it the next day. We told them, no, they're not going to do this the next day for two reasons. One, they're Skype. They're a really slow company. Sorry, I hope none of them is here. And number two, you do not change the address space of hundreds of millions of users overnight. They have an installed audience. They have a vested interest in what they already build. And because some small company introduced an app, they are not going to change everything overnight. So they are not going to do it. And in fact, today, three years later, they still haven't done it. So is the competition going to say, oh, this is a minor feature. I'm going to spend three days, do it, and kill you? So that's another good question to ask. And in case you're thinking patents, I'll give you two pieces of advice. One, they're not that defensible, and they're horribly uncool. So don't be that guy. Don't be the guy that defends this thing with patents or a girl. Um, so let's say you convince yourself, OK? So you're convincing your startup. You have this cool idea. You find a problem. You convince yourself. Let's take it to the next step. And we're talking consumer, so we're not talking about building new aircraft. We're not talking about a company which is going to redesign nuclear reactors. We're talking about the consumer space. Go to your friends. Ask them, do they want it? Okay? You're going to typically get one of three answers. Answer number one, nope, I don't want it. This is really bad. Uh-uh. Number two is the tricky one. They're going to tell you this is a great idea, but it's not for them. Number two is very much like number one. It's a very polite way of telling you no, but they're your friends, so they're going to say no. So one and two, same thing. The third one, that's the one you're after. Do they want your product? Now, don't expect every one of your friends to say yes, but expect enough of your friends to, to show an interest, to say, yes, I'd like to try it. Going back to my example, to, to Viber, Every one of our friends, or almost every one of our friends, has to be on the beta. So it gave us a, a feeling that there is definitely demand. So if you choose 10 people at random, 20 people at random, and they all say, yes, I want it, or half of them say, I want it, you probably have something interesting in your hands. 
Ah. Question, okay? How come no one has done this before? This question is not allowed. Never ask this question. Because if you always ask this question, there is never going to be any innovation. So just take this question and strike it out. If somebody asks you this question, just tell them this. You're not allowed to ask this question. This is forbidden. Move on to the next. So your friends want it, you want it, you have a problem, you have an idea. Now let's run some numbers. Is this something that's actually going to carry the day? Because sometimes you have this cool idea, but there isn't any money to be made in it. Um, it's just not going to deliver on your dream. Um, the numbers just don't add up. So start to do the map. This is when you go to Excel. Now, there are two ways to do an Excel. Bottom up and top to bottom. So you can go and say, OK, all I need is 1% of the people in China. Actually, in Brazil, it's a pretty big country. So all you need to say is 1% of the people in Brazil are going to accept it, which is nothing. What's 1%? I'm going to have 2 million users. Everything is going to be great. But that's not how the world works. The world works bottom up. So how many people am I actually going to get? If it's an app, how many people are going to, to download my app? Uh, how many people are going to sign up to my service? Not what percentage of the population. So go bottom up, run an analysis, run a real analysis. When you do your uh, cash flow analysis, don't forget about yourself. Founders have a tendency of forgetting that they also need to make money. So you need to earn money, you need to be paid the salary. So in that Excel, include yourself and don't put it as a buck a year or a dollar a year. Now the difficult one. You know, when, when you run your own business, you can take a day off anytime, right? I, I am here because I want to be here. I can take tomorrow off. I can take the next day off. There's really nobody that's going to tell me not to take a week off. I choose when to work. Unfortunately, founders, entrepreneurs, people that run their own businesses always choose to work. So you don't really get to choose. It's, it's a very fake feeling. Startups are draining. You're going to give everything to it. You are going to spend your days and nights um, you are going to spend time that you're virtually with your friends, but you're going to be on your phone doing emails or, or whatever. Uh, you're going to be thinking about it when you're in shower. You're going to be thinking about it when you're talking to your priest. You're going to be thinking about it all the time. There's no way to run away. There's nowhere to hide. And many of your friends are going to hate you for it. Um, so be prepared for it. Startups, especially in intensive startups, put a strain on your life. They put a strain on your relationships. Um, you have to ask yourself the question, are you ready to do it? Now, you all seem to be in your 20s, so that's a good time to start um, because you probably don't have a family. Um, but you should really take this into consideration. Startups are not easy. So even if everything adds up, you should ask yourself, are you ready for it? Because very significant commitment. The other thing is, don't do it on your own. Never start a startup on your own. You may be the smartest person on the planet. You may be uh, the best techie. You may be uh, the best business person, the best product person. But at the end of the day, you want to bounce ideas with somebody. You don't want to be the, the sole person in that company. So if you're a product person, if you're a marketing person, if you're a business person, find a tech guy. If you're a tech guy, find yourself a product person. Don't have two tech people starting a company. You're not adding much to each other, even though you, you probably have a better understanding of each other. Um, when you do find that person, um, leave an ejection seat open. I mean, I never had to, <clears throat> personally speaking, 
I never had to part ways with a partner, but this is to happen. So even if you think you chose the right person, it is possible that you haven't. Uh, they say that good fences make for good neighbors. So have a termination option. Uh, I probably could have put it in a, in a more subtle way. But make sure you have a way out of this relationship. You're the person that started it. They are not. Even if you're 50-50% partners, leave a way out for you and the other uh, the person. You're going to need money. There's no way around that. You may have money from home. You may come from a very rich family. Uh, but statistically, most of us don't. So you will need to raise money. If you can, try to postpone it as much as possible. If you can work out of your garage, spend a few months, you know, a bit ahead of the first hump, that's great. If you can afford it. Because the first money you're going to raise, the, what's known as the seed financing, is usually going to come from bad investors. I mean, you are not going to get a million dollars from Sequoia. Uh, you're probably going to get $100,000 or $200,000 from some rich guy that made his fortune in uh, maybe in construction, in the car wash service, or in something which is completely unrelated to what you're doing. So you just gave away statistically a third, if you're dumb, a half uh, of your company to somebody who's not going to add any value and who is always going to drag you down. Now, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying if there's a way to avoid it, avoid it. Um, when you end up doing financing, uh, whether from the seed investor or from a more established uh, VC, they're interviewing you. They're going to be asking you questions about your business, your business model, your personal life. They'll be asking you tons of questions. That's perfectly legitimate. It's okay. But you have the right to do the same. You have the right to interview their previous investments. Uh, this is not stepping out of line. You should ask them for references. You should do your own homework. Try to find them. Try to find their failed investments because we're all acting nicely when everything is successful but you see somebody's true colors when things go south. So try and find those investments that failed and talk to them. Entrepreneurs, by definition, will always be on your side. They'll tell you the truth. I remember years ago, somebody called me out of the blue and asked about somebody that invested in one of my previous companies. And they asked me, what do I think about this person? I told them, listen, I had two options. Take money from this guy or go be a toll booth operator, be a toll booth operator. That investor was that bad. So there are bad investors out there and entrepreneurs will typically tell you the truth. So make sure you ask. Some other things, things will not work as planned. Get ready for it. You have this crazy business plan, how you're going to grow sequentially, quarter over quarter. Everybody's going to love you. Everything's going to be successful. But things seldom work this way. I mean, reality is that you'll need to change. You'll need to adapt. Um, you should consider this when you're raising capital. You should raise some extra money. You should not build uh, an investment agreement that assumes that everything is going to be great and say, yeah, if, if the valuation of the company why? There, there's no reason to do that. You should always uh, assume the best and prepare for the worst because things will go south and this is when they get you. So consider the fact that it's not going to be smooth sailing and be prepared. Oh, and at least for the first two rounds, you and your partners should definitely be in control of the company. Over 50% is good enough. Okay. Do not take personal loans. You're building a business. Statistic has it that 90% of companies fail. That means that if you take a personal loan, one that goes under your name, there's a 90% chance that you're stuck with it. So the company may be dead and buried, but 
you're stuck with the loan. Don't take a personal loan. Never, ever take a personal loan. Never ever do something under your own name. Always do this under the corporation. If things die, your idea died, but you didn't go south with it. You can always do another one, and entrepreneurs that failed are typically better entrepreneurs because they learned something, um, or you can get a job, but at least you still have your life. Don't be stupid. Um, some random thoughts. Uh, focus. You should really focus. Don't jump from thing to thing to thing to thing. I have a friend that's been doing his startup for 13, 14 years, and he keeps on adding ideas and doing things and adding. And he's been trying his startup for 14 years now, and he's not going anywhere. You should really focus. So even though there are multiple opportunities and multiple opportunities will, will find you, focus on the core of what it is that you do. Don't go astray. Yeah. Last thought. Build a great product. Users know when you cut corners. So the users, I like to call it the craft meter. When you go on an app, I mean, you're, we all download the apps on the App Store. We download something, and after three thec seconds, we go like, oh, this is shit. Don't be the guy that develops an app that people say, oh, this is shit. So users know when you cut corners. They just, we all know it. On the mobile side, and this will be my, I believe, last slide. Um, the first version you develop is obviously Android. You do not start with developing for iOS, unless, of course, your target market is the US. This is the only market that where you're target. If you're targeting only the US, yeah, start with iOS. Otherwise, start with Android. If it seems to take off, go with iOS. If you're bored, you can go with Windows Phone. I did not say that. So, to summarize, there's always opportunity. You should just notice that opportunity. You should be aware. Be aware of what's happening. Um, evaluate your ideas. Do they make sense? Do they not? Find a partner and be careful how you raise money. So that's startups in an in a nutshell, uh, if you start your company, you're probably going to make your own mistakes. But maybe I can, you know, it's like a kid. A kid will always find a way to burn their hands with matches, no matter how many times you tell them. And I did my mistakes, and you will do your own mistakes. If I saved you one mistake, then hopefully this was a good, I don't know, half an hour or so. Thank you very much. Alguém tem alguma pergunta? É em português mesmo? É, saber se você tem investimento para fazer o Viber. He wanna know if Viber had any investments, external investments. That's an interesting question. Um, we, the, the founding group behind Viber pretty much funded Viber so far. So um, Viber is a very different company from, from others. You should, Viber is not the first thing that we did. So we were fortunate enough not to go, uh, not to need and go out there for VC funding. But yeah, this, this is not a very typical case. Você pensa em alguma atualização, algum incremento no Viber para não, não ter, por exemplo, um Skype aprimorando e 
ficar a mesma coisa? What do you Skype? I, I'm sorry? What are plans for Viber that's not just being a better Skype? We actually do not look at, uh, at Skype as our competitor. We consider WhatsApp to be our competitor. And uh, while we do compete with Skype pretty much on everything that they do, um, we still consider this to be the secondary function of Viber. Uh, so given that WhatsApp is the primary competition, given that uh, 76, 77% of daily active users are using messaging on Viber, uh, the question is, how do we make a better, uh, or the question should have been, how do we excel over WhatsApp? And the answer is by offering a better product, by uh, offering stickers, which WhatsApp does not do, by supporting multiple platforms. So we're not just mobile, we support uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, Android tablets, Windows 8, iPad is coming, uh, by uh, supporting by uh, letting you see that the other person actually uh, saw your message. Uh, by uh, having push to talk and not just um, voice messages. So Viber push to talk is, is real time. Uh, it's pretty much about delivering a better product. Primeiramente, parabéns. Eu sou usuário do Viber desde 2011. É, a minha pergunta é, você acredita na segmentação ou na massificação? Firstly, congratulate you. He said he's a, he's a Viber user since 2011, and he's asking if you believe in segmentation or massification of the app. Segmentation or? Massification of the app. Massification as in everybody being on the app? Yeah. Well, we definitely want everybody to be in our app. Today we have over 300 million users worldwide, uh, a number which is growing by, I think, 600,000 or so a day. Um, so we want to be a mass service. There, nothing gets more mass than communication because everybody needs it, everybody wants it. Um, hi, I'm, I'm an angel investor myself and I think it's quite challenging to uh, value a startup company, especially because the entrepreneurs usually think that uh, their own companies are uh, worth much more than they actually are. So do you have any advice for that? how to value and how to, uh, to prove uh, to an entrepreneur how much uh, his company actually uh, is worth? You know, a company is worth what people are willing to sell it for and what people are willing to buy it for. Uh, some entrepreneurs are more realistic than the others. Some investors are more realistic than the others. Um, the, your objective as an entrepreneur, if you're doing a seed round of finance, angel investor, assuming that we're talking about uh, an angel round, is to try and maximize the, the value of, of his or her company, while at the same time making sure not to raise money from somebody uh, who's going to be bad news moving forward. I, I, I don't know if this, uh, if, if this helps, but <coughs> it's give and take between uh, the investor and the uh, and, and the founders. Here. Uh, how do you make money with Viber? And what's your uh, advice for a new startup to, to do their product? Uh, is about like making money from, from your customers right away or starting doing like free stuff for them to gain their trust and then, I don't know, make money uh, in another way instead of the, the first product that you do. Okay. In the case of Viber, we started monetizing about a month or two ago. We have two offerings, which are, uh, we have a freemium model. So you can buy stickers on Viber, which uh, are becoming increasingly popular. Um, to date, on the free side, users downloaded over 100 million sticker packs in the month or two since we launched Viber stickers. Uh, but we also offer freemium stickers, both Viber content as well as third-party content like uh, the Smurfs, Hello Kitty, and, and a bunch of other things. Uh, that's one thing. We also offer Viber Out, which allows you to uh, call numbers which are not users which are not on Viber, both from mobile and from desktop. And this is at prices which are lower than Skype. We also 
the other person, the person receiving your call can see who's calling because we can put the caller ID. We also have a book on the PC so you don't have to manually uh, enter the number that you're dialing. So that's for Viber. And there are more things which we're building uh, in order to monetize Viber. As an entrepreneur looking to build a company, there, there is no right answer. Um, it, it really depends on what you're doing. In some cases, you want to stay, start making money out of day one because you have a service which if you will not charge for, uh, you, will, you will get users used to not paying for it. So if, if you're offering something A, if you intend to charge for A long term, start charging for A on day one <clears throat> because you will not manage to set the price for something that is free. So for example, Viber is, offers a free service. If we started charging users tomorrow for our service just because, I think this will be a horrible mistake. Um, so if you're going to charge later, charge something else. Um, if, but there is no right or wrong answer. It really depends on, the, on your circumstances. It's easier to attract a user base uh, to something which is free. I would definitely not put, I would try if possible to avoid uh, placing um, uh, a price on downloading an app or on starting to use a service. So don't put the pay screen right in the front screen. Let users get something for free and, and, and try to upsell. Or you can use an ad-based model, again, depending if you're, what it is that you're doing. No right or wrong answer. Sorry. You said that um grande concorrente do, do Vibe é o WhatsApp, né? E recentemente foi lançado o Vibe para Windows, Linux e Mac. É, vocês quis, quiseram diferenciar do WhatsApp ou a Skype? Qual foi a finalidade mesmo de estar lançando um aplicativo que foi voltado para mobile? Uh, we recently launched um, Mac, Windows Phone and other versions uh, from Viber. Uh, are we trying to become more differentiated uh, against WhatsApp or more close to Skype doing that? I think the latter is the answer. We, Vi Viber inherently is a mobile company. When it comes to the mobile space, as far as Skype is concerned, we won the war. We won the war not yesterday, not a year ago. We probably won the war in the first year. Um, so Skype is not our competition on the mobile side. When it comes to WhatsApp, yes, we do believe that offering multiple platforms is uh, differentiates us uh, on one end and at the same time makes our users happier. If one of the most popular searches on, uh, on Google when it came to Viber before we announced uh, Viber for, uh, for desktop was Viber for PC, Viber for Mac. People really wanted it uh, and we're seeing that. We're seeing that users on, uh, on PC and Mac are actually more engaged both on the PC but they're also more engaged on, on mobile as well. So these are people that like our service more. É, boa tarde, meu nome é João. É, no início do seu projeto do Viber, a fun função dele era voltada para ter algum ganho ou um projeto mais social? When you started Viber, are, were you planning to make money with Viber or just having the service as as a social thing for starting? We did not do it as a pastime. It's not like we were bored and said, let's pretty much kill our free time for the next millennia. Um, there was always a plan to make money. We did not necessarily know how to make money. What we said early on was, we're in a very strategic place at the, core, at, at the heart of uh, the user's communication needs. So there will always be a way to, to monetize it. Um, now, as we grow uh, older and wiser, we are adding ways to monetize. So stickers, Viber Out, and a few more things uh, coming in 2014. But we want to make sure that when we monetize the application, we do not um, antagonize users. So we're not going to put big pop-ups, please buy. We're not going to plaster the app with dollar signs. Uh, we're not definitely going to put ads. There will never be... We will never take screen real estate and just put banner ads. Um, we want to make sure that you can continue using the application, uh, even if you're not paying, in an enjoyable way. 
Hi, I'm Rodrigo, and I'm wondering what was the marketing plan for Viber? How how you start? How you start the marketing? Uh, you said it, uh, it's always it's better to start with Android, but you got like a billion apps on Android. How was the marketing? You marketing in other platforms like TV, internet, or some other other medias? Uh, how was the marketing for Viber? And thanks, I love your product. I use like uh, since 2009, I think 2010. Uh, not 2009. 2009. I'm not using it since 2009. Uh, uh, no, I think of. <laughs> 10. You launched 2010, so I'm using since 2010. All right. Thanks. We actually had a multi-million-dollar marketing budget to promote Viber, and we had the marketing plan. We thought we would launch it, see that the the product was stable, and then start significantly spending media. And then we went live, and three days later, we had um, a million downloads. So we took the money and said, okay, no need, no need for a marketing budget. So we scrapped the marketing budget and just let it grow. It's not, this, this is not a common case of, uh, of how apps grow. So. There's a lot to learn from Viber, but at the same time, you should not expect your app to instantly uh, become popular. You will need to work on it, in, all, in most cases. Bom, é, boa tarde. É, eu, eu tenho alguns negócios no Brasil, é, na área de tecnologia, com investimento, e percebo que os investidores aqui, eles gostam não apenas de você colocar sua alma e colocar o seu suor no negócio, mas ver um comprometimento financeiro também seu. Percebi que na sua palestra você fala de jamais fazer empréstimos pessoais para colocar no... Então eu queria saber é, o, o porquê disso. Eu entendo que obviamente não é bom você colocar um dinheiro seu no negócio, mas é, de repente pela facilidade de você atrair é, esse investimento e mostrar que você de fato está comprometido com o negócio, é, talvez seja uma opção... É interessante, principalmente porque as companhias aqui no Brasil, logo quando elas são lançadas, elas não têm um fomento muito grande, principalmente por instituições privadas e até mesmo públicas. Yes. He mentioned that uh, Brazilian investors usually want not only the commitment of the, the entrepreneur, but also the, the financial commitment of, of the entrepreneur. And you mentioned that it's not um, a good thing to do loans under your name. So how to balance that since in Brazil you don't have much uh, support on public or private invest investments? I, an investor, uh, a seed investor that is asking you to put your own money goes under the list of a seed investor that you do not want. Uh, they, they just don't understand what it takes to build a company. So don't be stupid. It goes under that. Never. Um, We got some questions here on Viber. First of, of them will be, is there any plan to build or uh, have a, a corporate product from Viber? We're being asked that question a lot, uh, either by the media or by corporations. It's, it's definitely something that we're considering, uh, but there's nothing to announce right now. We know a lot of corporations are using Viber uh, internally for, uh, uh, for, for internal communications. Um, if you want to build something, you know, that uh, will fit the corporation for 10,000 or 100,000 people, then you need other features. Maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't. In our heart, we're really a consumer company. Okay, one other question. Uh, this person says that the, one of the major problems on smartphones is the battery. And all the notifications that we receive from a lot of apps uh, drags the battery off. Uh, is Viber planning anything that allows people to manage better the notification that they receive? Well, if somebody sends you a message, we're going to display a notification. Um, there's, there's not much that can be done uh, around that, because otherwise, what are we doing? You can obviously disable notifications. If you're on iOS, you can turn off the app and you can turn off notifications from Viber. Um, I'm not sure why you will have Viber to begin with it, it, under this scenario, but it will work. Um, on iOS, there's, a, on, sorry, on Android, there's also a way to exit the app 
And again, you will not get notifications um, or you video. It's battery life is a problem, and uh, we're doing our best to optimize that. So, um, Viber is probably more friendly to the battery than most other applications out there, but at the same time, there's only so much that you can do and still maintain uh, connectivity. There's not a lot of hope, let's say, in the next few years in terms of uh, improvement in battery technology. So we're all kind of stuck with uh, a phone and chasing a socket. Uh, one more, what was the best and the worst moment on building fiber and releasing to the audience? The best moments with Viber are either just looking at the numbers and see them grow, or getting some story from a user that's rewarding. Uh, I was uh, to a wedding in Texas, which unfortunately I could not attend um, a, a few weeks ago, on a couple which told us that if it wasn't for Viber, they could never have kept in touch. The, the guy was in, uh, in Afghanistan, the wife was in Texas, and uh, that's how they built and maintained their relationship. So that's, th th that's a rewarding story. So th these are the good things. The bad things, the bad things is all the rest. It's just a lot of work. It's a lot, a lot of work. It's all the traveling uh, around, in my case. Uh, it's all the, uh, the many sleepless nights. It's waking up at uh, uh, 3 a.m. because uh, a server crashed, because something is not working, because there is a problem. It's, uh, it's talking to a user and they show you, hey, I have a problem. Every time somebody tells you they have a problem with the app, um, as a founder at least, I always, it's, it's always personal. It's never, okay, whatever. I, I would always take a close look and, and see if it can be worked. Um, I, hopefully, thankfully, this does not happen on a daily basis, but seeing something that does not work is, is never fun. Well, time for the last question. A uh, person asked, uh, are we planning to launch video for mobile and when? And are we planning any disruptive features in the nearby future? So you're, who asked this? Someone through Viber. Oh, and they don't have Viber on, the, and they don't have video on their mobile? Because I have, I have video on my Vi. Maybe this is because it's a version we didn't release yet. Okay, and any disruptive innovation in the nearby future? I thought that's what we're doing on a daily basis. Well, people, thank you.